All right. Um, good afternoon, folks. Uh, I am expecting uh, Mr. Chucky Tiller to join me shortly. Any moment down, share the video. A live, special, exclusive interview with Chucky Taylor. He has a message for the Liberian people and uh, he has asked for us to uh, interview him uh, to share this special message with the Liberian people. So he, as you all know, Chucky Taylor uh, is in prison serving a 97 year sentence. Um, and uh, he spoke last week to the BBC and he said he had a message and um, for the world. And now he would like to convey that same message. Uh, actually, an, an amended version of that same message to to the Liberian people. So share the podcast. It is an exclusive interview with Chucky Taylor, as we know him, uh, Charles Taylor Jr. And uh, he should be calling me any minute now from his uh, prison cell um, in Virginia, the United States of America. I'm awaiting his call. Uh, he is supposed to call me any minute now. Welcome. Share the video. I'm awaiting the call of Mr. Chucky Taylor uh, from um, his prison cell. He has a special message for the Liberian people that he would have us provide the platform for him to convey. So share the video while we await Mr. Chucky Taylor to speak to the Liberian people. All right. Let me call someone, person who facilitated this call, this interview. Okay, I believe I have him. From a federal prison. You will not be charged for this call. This call is from... Roy. This call will be recorded and subject to monitoring at any time. To accept this call, press 5. To block this call, in all... You may begin speaking now. Good afternoon, sir. Go Good. Speaking. Good afternoon. Is this uh, Chucky Taylor? Yeah, I no longer recognize that name, but yes. Gumai, if you don't mind. Gumai. I, with respect, sir, Gumai. This is Mr. Costa. This is Henry Costa. So this is Gumai, formerly known yes. as Chucky Taylor. Correct, correct. All right, so hold on. I have about 1,000 people already listening. Let me just ask them, folks, can you hear my guest, Mr. Gumai? Can you hear him loud and clear, folks? Can somebody tell me whether they can hear him? Yes, I believe they can hear you. So, Mr. Gumai, first of all, let's begin with why the name change? Uh, that was for personal reasons, but I will say that uh, it was largely predicated upon uh, a cultural re-identification. I respect that, sir. Now, uh, today is the 19th day of December, and we are just a few weeks away from, uh, well, a, a, a few days from Christmas. What message do you have for the Liberian people? A couple of days away from Christmas. Well, that's really a loaded question, but uh, let me start by saying this. Unfortunately, in my BBC interview, it was explained to me that the interview had to be extremely concise. But first, uh, I also want to say that in my initial interview with Al Jerome, uh, I extended an apology to our people. Uh, I did so again in the BBC interview. But I want to make a more formal apology. 
and I want to symbolically hold the feet of not only all of our elders, but as well as my peers and the younger generation as well. As well. I want to formally apologize for being a part of anything that may have had a negative impact on our people. I want to formally apologize to our people for not advocating for those who I should have advocated for. I want to formally apologize for having the ignorance of my youth guide my understanding. Many of us were led to believe that what we saw back in those days was for a greater good. But I really want to dig into this because people don't understand that this apology is not connected to my freedom per se. The law, this case is predicated upon law and facts. And this also should underscore how important and close to my heart this apology, this formal apology is. Because if I place it in a different context, people will begin to appreciate why it is so important for me to contribute to the process of reconciliation by this formal apology. And more importantly, God willing, earn the respect of our people based upon action, not just words, because words ring hollow without actions. But imagine, are we saying among, as African people, we are not prepared to respect and honor our own, protect our young, shelter and protect our women and feed the elderly and as well? That we are only prepared to show love and respect to those who do not, do not look like ourselves? That under the worst conditions, that we have no understanding or consideration for the lives of our, of those who form part of our bloodline on that continent of Africa. Having, having self-educated myself, pursued vigorously informal education, learning about Pan-Africanism, post-African history, specifically the independence era and what has taken place up till now, it is mandatory for me to make this apology. And I'm glad you'll give me the platform and enough time to be able to make it in a way that can be truly heard and felt. Well, I, anti I anticipated this interview to have been scheduled for another time. Well, uh, there couldn't be a better time and feel free because this is a massive platform. Lots of people will listen uh, in Liberia and around the world and other radio stations will take this interview and they will run with it. You trust me, it's going to go viral. Uh, let me say this to you. I know from reading that lots of times when people go to prison, it gives them a, a time, a moment to reflect, to learn, and, 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 and a lot of times, a lot of personal transformation takes place. Could we say that is what has happened to you? Have you enlightened yourself, educated yourself? You've come to realize that... Um, this call is from a federal prison. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll say this. That, that's an understatement. But yes, I've had to I've had to grow and I had to make a very firm choice under the most desolate conditions. I'm in a level five penitentiary, one of some of the most violent institutions in the federal system. This is the second unit that I've been on where someone has actually been killed. This is a very combative and difficult environment, but I found peace, self-reflection within myself, a humble strength because I'm <clears throat> because. I believe that a man must be strong both mentally and physically. But there's a favorite quote that I have. Character is not made of sunshine and roses, but like steel it is forged in the fire between the hammer and the anvil. This has been my hammer and this has been the fire. And I told a friend the other day that, you know, this fire no longer burns, it purifies. Uh, you know, you really have to be confronted with whether or not you want to live or be a part of causes greater than yourself than to be a part of selfish endeavors and allow one's vices to overrule them. True men of strength control themselves, their vices, and attach themselves to a greater cause and make readjustments and face up to their mistakes as men. So what I'm saying here is this, is that not only am I truly sorry, but I understand my errors and I pray to the almighty creator that I have an opportunity at some stage to contribute to that correction. Because truth and reconciliation is a permanent exercise. This is not something to be spoken about. We look at the 
I, I look at Liberia and I think about three major traumas. I think about the historical transatlantic slavery. I think about the, the, the trauma of our people returning back to the motherland and imposing a system of, of new colonialization upon those indigenous to the land. And then I think about the Civil War. So imagine all of those degrees of trauma. This is a never-ending healing process. True. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, what, how old were you? Now, you were pretty young. I was in Liberia. You were pretty young when you got involved with your father's uh, fighting forces. How, just how old were you? And, and there's, there's always a tendency that a, a young person is very likely, very prone to being influenced and, and to being impressionable. Just how old were you when you got involved? Do you think that might have played a role? in you taking up uh, uh, an active role in the uh, fighting forces? Well, let's, let's contextualize that because, again, like I made very clear, and, and you know, I, as I said, I re would really like a more structured interview. This is very impromptu, but I would like to make a full presentation before our people because context is important. I was not the commander of the ATU, but to say that none of us made an intellectual contribution to Mr. Taylor and securing him would be wrong. But I will also say this to Liberian people. There were credible threats not only against my life, but against the old man. Okay? So that's true. One, that's number one. Number two. That is, that, is, that is true. That is inarguable. Yes. And I was in my early 20s. This call is from a federal prison. There's a book called My Friend the Mercenary by John Brabazon. And I found it very interesting because... His book came out before the one written by Johnny Dwyer. And he was far more accurate in his description of my activity back then, as opposed to Mr. Dwyer, who had conducted a so-called years-long investigation or a number of years before he uh, managed to publish. But what I will say is this, is that yes, I was extremely young, but more importantly, I don't want anybody to be under the wrong impression. I was not in Liberia during the 90s. I was 13 years old. I'm born in 1977. I was living in Florida with my mother. I traveled to Liberia for three months during 1992 to see a father that turned his back on me when I was a child. Okay? And then I returned back to Liberia in 1994. So during the mass abuses, I was not in the country during the Civil War. More importantly, the name Chucky did it. Often, people... It's embedded in their psyches, and it leads them to believe that I had some active role during that time. No. And, and why is that? Why did people think, why did people fear you? Why did people mystify you into this uh, will, terrible boogeyman? This. Why? I, I, will, I will say this. I will say that I am partly to blame, but it is my inherent introverted nature. I'm not someone who... Uh, who yearns for attention or popularity. Very few people knew me or interacted with me in Liberia. And that helped to create the mystique, so to speak. And I will tell you this, with credible threats against my life, okay, with some of the rumors that I were hearing, I chose not to even discourage or rebut at that time. On top of the fact that many people told me, oh, disregard that, that's not something for you to address. I was surrounded by sycophants, individuals who did not provide me proper advice as a young man. And I will say this, no one taught me honor, integrity, and discipline. I had to rely on the moral compass my mother gave me. My mother's a West Indian woman. Anybody who knows people from the West Indies knows that they are very strict people. So to say that I came to Liberia as some wild and loose young man is also a mischaracterization. Okay? But like I said, this was... This was uh, an impromptu. I actually thought that I was calling you. You are doing great. Uh, you are doing great. We have 2,000 people watching and, sir, and many tens of thousands will listen and watch later. Let me ask you another question. You are doing fantastically well. You are a very brilliant, well-spoken well man. I must say this. When you did an interview with the BBC, it was my first time having an opportunity to hear you speak. And I was fascinated by your brilliance. I'm going to say this. And, 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 and this is not only uh, an opinion of mine, this is also shared by the thousands who are currently watching. Now, let me say this to you. Um, you are right. As a young man, you were surrounded by all these people who just told you whatever you wanted to hear. And as you said, very honestly, you allowed this mystique about you, this uh, boogeyman character, to be enlarged, to be, to be what people felt you were. 
but you were not this person, right? You, you say you were introverted. Right. Right. And I still am. But I've learned, I'll put it this way. I also, think, I also realize that I have some varying degree of ADHD. I read this book by Mr. Hartman, and he talked about a hunter in a farmer's world. And I'll say this is that although I'm an introvert, I have learned other skills. Uh, I've, you know, I've, at one point in time, I led a program here called Stop the Violence, helping these young men, you know, transition their, their anger and their hatred into more positive ends. And I use it as a time to sort of build on my public speaking skills. But yes, so, you know, although I am someone who prefers to be in the background, who prefers substance at this stage in my life, I also am prepared to speak up. And this is the reason why uh, I really wanted to take the world by storm, to be honest. I've been litigating this case since 2017, had learned the law since 13, and I've been faced with tons of misrepresentation by multiple prosecutors, uh, qu highly questionable federal rulings by courts, and I come to the conclusion that the law alone will not get this case overturned, that I, no man is an island. I believe in self-reliance, and I fought hard all of these years, diligently, I mean, under circumstances and times where I literally had to choose whether or not I would buy legal books and, or put food in my locker. And I chose the former. Okay. And this is the reason why. Proceed. I have a question right after you said the reason why. Yes. Hello? Go ahead, sir. No, no, no. What I wanted to say is that you uh, received quite a... Hefty sentence, 97 years. That's quite unusual. Very, very long sentence. Do you feel that you were unfairly targeted as a result of you being your father's son? Do you feel that the merits of the case brought against you? Now, I'm not trying to exonerate you of any wrongdoing, but I'm saying the specific case that, were, that, that was brought against you and the counts that were brought against you and the, and the evidence upon which that case was supposedly tried. Do you think that... That verdict, that sentence of 97 years, uh, goes hand in hand with the merits and demerits of that particular case? Or do you feel you would try unfairly and heavy handle it because you are your father's son? Well, the, the facts speak for themselves because right now there is a, there's a cognitive dissonance between the evidence that they claim they was, <clears throat> that they were supposed to put forward to the jury that proves guilt and the actual verdict itself. This phone is about to cut off, sir. Please afford me the ability for us to, or for us to schedule a more structured interview. I want to give 130 minutes to this audience. Would, so would, can really would do that. Can we do that on Wednesday? On Wednesday at the same time. Wednesday at 145, same time, for as long as you want. Can we do that? Let's consider this a teaser. That's right. Sure enough. You have a deal, sir. Thank you. Thank you, and thank the audience. Thank, thank you so audience. much. 145 Tuesday. Fellow librarians, there you have it. Uh, this was the teaser. I thought it was a full interview, but it's just a teaser. Uh, Mr. Chucky Taylor will be back with us. What day did I say? Did I say Wednesday or Tuesday? I'm going to confirm that with him. Uh, we're going to do a more. Uh, we're we're going to do some publicity. We didn't create any awareness as, as well. I got this uh, impromptu. The interview was planned, uh, but then they did. It was supposed to happen on Sunday. I say Wednesday, right? Wednesday at 1.45 p.m. So I'm going to call the guy and make sure we have a schedule for Wednesday, 1.45 p.m. And it's going to be a, a much longer version of this interview with uh, Chucky Taylor. He now calls himself uh, Gomai. He no longer wants to be called Chucky Taylor. He says he no longer wants to have ties with his father. And he opened the interview by profusely, profusely. Uh, apologizing to the Liberian people. So one Wednesday, 1.45 p.m., we're going to have a longer version of this interview with Chucky Taylor from his uh, level five uh, maximum security uh, prison penitentiary in Virginia. Wednesday, 1.45 p.m., lock it down, spread the word, spread this teaser. We're going to be back here. Have yourselves a wonderful, blessed Sunday. Wednesday, 1.45 p.m., Chucky Tiller, 1.45 Eastern Time. Chucky Tiller from his maximum facility at uh, uh, a maximum security prison. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day.
Bye-bye.